Time now, though, to hear a story of a remarkable man from Lincolnshire who's testament to the fact that nothing should stand in the way of achieving your goals. Uh, Stefan Novak from Cherry Willingham has been visually impaired for most of his life, but he's also worked at one of the most prestigious banks in the world, met his wife via a TV programme, and is now planning to raise money for guide dogs for the blind in her memory. When I went to meet Stefan, he told me when he first realised he had sight problems. I was about eight years old. I was still living in Lincoln at the time. And I remember dropping a sixpence on the floor. And you have to be quite old to know what a sixpence is. <laughs> and I dropped it on the floor. And I remember it was a blue kitchen floor. And my mum said, what's wrong? Can't you see it? And I said, no. And I was feeling around the floor. And that was the first, the very first memory I have of not being able to see something. And was that affecting both of your eyes? Uh, yes, I think it was. I think it was because it was creeping up on me slowly. I possibly didn't even notice. But then, obviously, it, things did get worse and they started to notice at school. And then life started to become very, very difficult. What was diagnosed? Um, what I've got is retinitis pigmentosa, RP for short. And what it is, it's the optic nerve and the retina that are damaged. And that, that happens at birth. And it sometimes misses the girls, but it always gets the boys, I understand. And uh, it's very progressive. And they did say when, when you get older, it will get worse. Did you then have to have some specialist treatment at the time to, to try and halt it, to try and slow it down? Uh, no, not at all. In actual fact, there was nothing that they could do. And what I went through then for the next, oh, I suppose, four or five years was very difficult school life no one understood that I had got a sight problem I suppose my parents didn't even they thought oh okay but you know didn't really make much of it I suppose at the time that's what I can recollect but the schooling that I had was was getting harder and harder the teachers were getting more and more annoyed with me I do remember been at the school up at Waddington at St Clement's and I always remember coming from the back of the class further and further to the front and I thought it was because I was being naughty or cheeky but I knew I wasn't because I wasn't that sort of kid. Were you getting frustrated? Was it annoying for you? Absolutely because I, I didn't know what was going on really I just because it was so gradual in the beginning your eyesight and I didn't know what was going on of course that by this time I was at the front of the classroom and I could then see I thought oh that's better I can see the blackboard and then you can guess what's coming I had to go to the blackboard and then sort of read a bit and then go back to my desk and write it and it was just exhausting but the problem was the teacher wasn't very happy didn't understand thought I was being disruptive and also the the other kids 20 odd kids were saying get out of the way Novak mind your big nose I've got a big nose people and um, they were saying get out of the way mind your big nose and, and it, it was awful it must have been such a difficult time for you but you didn't let it hold you back you're an intelligent man and and that's proved because you had a very responsible job are you talking about the one at the very prestigious exclusive bank? Yes, indeed. Yeah, I ended up getting there because I worked in retail for seven years in Lincoln. My dad died um, in, in 79 and I thought, well, I don't want to live at home with mum for the rest of my life and I need to make something of myself. So I found out what was available for courses for blind people, went to London for an interview and because the only thing that the Cherry Willingham School did for me was to teach me to type with all, all four fingers or, and, and thumbs, and I could touch type, and so I did a secretarial course, and in those days, it was like, oh, you're a secretary, you do a girl's job. And I thought, well, no, I don't really. And, um, and, I, and of course, you, you do your course, you pass your exam, and then you're left to sort of, well, you work, you, all the other um, students seem to get help from the RNIB, but I, they, were, they were sort of like exhausting the same old businesses, Barclays and BP and all the same places in London. And I went out on my own and someone said to me, have you tried all the banks? And I said, well, yeah, you know, the main four or five or whatever it was in those days. And he said, have you tried Coots? And I sort of looked at him and thought, who, who are Coots? And he said, if you don't know who Coots are, he said, well, I think you need to find out more. And of course, I, I'd walked past this building opposite Charing Cross Station for a year or so. I thought, I wonder what that is. But of course, I couldn't see what the place was called, but I could see this great big glass building. 
And anyway, this was this exclusive bank. And I basically got an interview, a five hour interview, then another two hour interview. And then I got the job. You had to wear black, which is good because I wear, that's why I wear black now. And you had to wear black three piece suit and black tie, black shiny shoes, no facial hair, because in the old days, you weren't allowed to have any facial hair because they used to smuggle out uh, sovereigns in their in their beards and tash. I said coins would be hidden in the in the yeah, beards. Yeah, and also there was <laughs> it was known that that lady somebody or other had come for an interview, and someone had rang her that afternoon and said. Was everything all right, lady, lady, whoever? And she said, yes. She said, but it would be rather nice if he could have cleaned his beard before he'd met me. He had food dripping out of his beard. So from then on, all the men had to be clean shaven and we all had to wear black frock coats down to your knee. We were very smart, but they were very cumbersome, but the girls could wear what they liked. But um, I was there for 20 years. Just imagine that, uh, smuggling out coins in your beard in the banks of years gone by. Stefan Novak from Cherry Willingham. More from Stefan in just a moment. We're sharing with you a story of Stefan Novak from Cherry Willingham. He's been visually impaired for most of his life. As we've heard, he worked in one of the most prestigious banks in the world. But he went on to tell me how he met his wife via a TV programme. I left the bank and we'd been out for a drink. I'd got home, turned the TV on, thought I'll have a cup of tea, see what's on TV. Of course, I couldn't see TV unless I was looking right on top of it. And there was a programme on called Contacts on Thames Television, which is now obviously Carlton. And at the end of the programme, they had like a dating slot. It, it wasn't anything like Blind Date. The programme was just, you know, you might want to sort of meet up someone who wanted to go tandem in around the world or skydiving or whatever. It was, a, it was just what it said, contacts. But at the end, they had a dating slot. Uh, I thought, well, why don't I write him myself? OK, I thought, well, I've got, I'm going blind. But I thought I had a lot of love to give. And of course, if you can't see... It's that's another uh, difficulty because you can't you can't sort of like I, I don't know how you meet people in, in the sighted world. Do you do you wink at each other? Do you look at each other? What do you do? Do you get do you, I, I don't know how it's done, but it, it, it wasn't really happening for me. So I thought, well, I'll, I'll ring in the ring the ring into the show. It, of course, it was 12, one o'clock. Lines were open until two. And I thought of and I, that that night, nothing, nothing happened. And I watched it again and I thought, I'm going to ring in once more and if they don't ring me back, blow it, I'm not going to bother. Anyway, of course, they rang me straight back. It was about quarter to two Friday morning and they said, yes, we'd like you to come in. I went in for a five-hour interview because they wanted to find out, you know, if I was dodgy or what I, what I was looking for. And then they said, if we wanted you on set at short notice, could you come in? And, of course, I was working at the bank. I kept everything to myself. And then they rang me the following day and they said, right, we need you in this afternoon for the shoot. Are you OK? I said, yes, I'll get the time off. I went in to do the shoot and then it went out that following night. So it wasn't live, but we recorded it as it was. And then you have to wait for the letters to come in. And um, seven letters came in my pigeonhole at my apartment first and 43 in total. But the next problem was I couldn't see to read them. So all these letters were coming and the first seven came. But what I did, I sort of ran back up to my apartment and thought, right, we'll read it. And I'll, uh oh, what what can't you do? And I thought, can't read the letters. Because if it was print, I could have put them under my camera and enlarged the print. But they were all handwritten. So anyway, I opened them, analysed the paper, first class, second class. But what I did, I pulled one out and I got this very strong vibe. I, I, I was right because I thought this is the letter for me. And all I could go on was odd note paper, small envelope, second class stamp, and it was 17p in those days. So I thought, well, she's obviously loaded. She's put a 17p stamp on, and that was all I knew. And I met my best friend uh, a few days later, and my friend was very methodical. She said, OK, and she spread them out on the table. And I leant over, and I felt this one. And I said, read this one first, Helen. And she said, no, no. She said, we'll do them. I said, read this one first, please. It's important. So she read it, and she said, oh, dear, Stefan, blah, blah. Uh, oh, I might have guessed, she said. You've read all of these. That's why you wanted me to read it first. And I said, what, what? And she said, she's an air hostess at Gatwick. Well, wouldn't you know? And I just thought, wow, oh, OK. And she said, don't get excited. She said, we'll put that on one side and we'll read the rest. And I thought, 
no i am ex wow air hostess but that wasn't it because i had the vibe before before i even knew that 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 it made a difference but it wasn't the be all and end all tell me her name she was called lynn and how much time did you have together we had 19 years 19 wonderful beautiful years and when did lynn die well we met in in 1989 we got married in in portugal in 1990 on the beach sorry engaged in 1990 on the beach we got married in dallas fort worth in stetsons and boots we flew concord because she had staff travel and uh, we did lots of lovely things we loved each other to bits and sadly she was diagnosed the same month in 204 as i was diagnosed she was diagnosed with liver and bowel cancer and i was told i had to go on dialysis in november 2004 so that was a, a a blow and i sadly lost her in 2008 four years ago but you had some wonderful times together absolutely i mean all, all my memories i mean people quite often say better to have loved and and than never loved at all and I, I guess that's right but it sometimes doesn't help but the memories are like little videos in my i know it's probably hard for people to understand if you're blind how do you have little videos but you do and bearing in mind that my sight's got worse over the years so there is a lot of stuff that I have seen and Lynn was the sort of person she was a wonderful caring bright bubbly nothing was too much trouble not just for me but for anybody everyone loved Lynn your latest project is actually in memory of Lynn isn't it it is to name a puppy you have to raise five thousand pound in two years and i thought well i could do that no problem but you name a puppy and what guide dogs for the blind say is you come up with three names and i'm not sure if they pick the one they best like or you put the one you want at the top or whatever but i needed to know that the name i was going to have would be my wife's and I knew that if they would agree to that, then that would give me the motivation to go out and raise the money. And where are you now with that project? Let's say we started 1st of January on my website, www.stefannovak.com. It says on the uh, Name a Puppy link, uh, 820. But I've been told I've got another £500 check coming I've got another £100 tomorrow because I'm doing a talk and I've got more money to count. So I guess it's going to push it up to about fourteen or 1500 in under three months. And what will it mean to you when, because I know you'll do this, when you get that puppy named after Lynn? It'll be wonderful because um, I get to meet the puppy. Obviously, it'll have to be bright-eyed, larger than life and blonde because Lynn had long blonde hair. So I, it'll be one of the things that you know, will be a, a massive achievement, but it won't be the be all and end all because the, the be all and end all is I'm writing the first of my three books and I visualise the first book as a movie and I think that would be the ultimate. A remarkable man, Stefan Novak from Cherry Willingham. And I'll put a link to Stefan's website on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash BBC Lincolnshire.